Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host, with another marvellous video. Today, we belong to an age that has horror movies crammed with over-the-top inhuman killing machines. Things, however, were undoubtedly different two decades ago. In fact, the year 2001 introduced us to a raging beast that not only had an epic sartorial sense, but also drove a personalised truck while listening to circumstantially fitting music. Yep, we're talking about Victor Salva's immortal demon, the Creeper, from Jeepers Creepers, who, to date, has a notorious reputation for coming back every 23rd spring, killing for 23 non-stop days and then disappearing. Mind you, when we say killing, we're basically referring to the Creeper relishing human body parts of his choice and at times even harvesting them. After Jeepers Creepers, Salva went ahead with two more sequels, acquainting us fans with the most terrifying looking winged predator that left behind a rich legacy with a massive cult following. Then came the fourth entry in the Jeepers Creepers film franchise, which was Jeepers Creepers Reborn in 2022. Directed by Timo Warren Sola and backed by a screenplay play by Sean Michael Argo, Reborn was strategically made as part of a completely new trilogy to serve itself as a reboot for the series, with not the slightest bit of connection to Salva or his original trilogy. This brings us to today's video, where we'll be exploring the entire life of Jeepers Creepers, putting stress on all the movies that have been released, the comic book series that emphasized the Creeper's origin, all the exciting facts and theories surrounding the Creeper, his powers, and lastly, everything that we know about Jeepers Creepers 5. Yeah, you heard that right. If you've seen Reborn, you'll agree with us when we tell you that the movie did end on a note that was entirely meant to kickstart the new trilogy. So, here's addressing every fan of the Creeper. We suggest you stay tuned till the end of the video because this is gonna be a fascinating one. Are you ready? Let's dive right into the video then. But before we get into our explanation, we do have one very small request. If you enjoy our content, then please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you. Now, let's begin. Fear takes a road trip. Jeepers Creepers, 2001. Siblings Trish and Derry are driving through the Florida countryside back home from college for spring break when they find an RV up ahead of them. Derry, who's in the driving seat, speeds up the car to get a closer look at the RV vanity plate, and the audience learns that reading out the vanity plate of vehicles is a game that the siblings often enjoy playing. As they overtake the RV and continue to drive, the RV behind them suddenly branches off the main road, and an old beat-up truck from behind approaches the sibling duo, unbeknownst to them. The truck begins to tailgate them while constantly honking, and after some time, passes their car. This is when the viewers get their first peek at the truck's license plate, which reads, Be Eating You. With Darry and Trish continuing further down the road, they find the same truck parked next to what seems like an old abandoned church, and the driver dumping something that looks like bodies wrapped in bloodstained sheets down a pipe. This is also when the mysterious driver, seen donning a long, dark-hued duster coat and hat with his face covered, notices the siblings watching him. Trish tells her brother to get them out of there, and attempts to to look for Derry's cell phone in the back seat when she notices the truck pursuing their car. Even with Danny speeding the car, the truck catches up with them and starts hitting the back of the car. This continues until the truck runs them off the road into the field and drives off. After Derry fixes the car trunk, he's determined to return to the church and see what the driver was dumping down the pipe earlier. Trish is hesitant, but she eventually agrees to go with her brother. As they go back to the church, they find it surrounded by crows, and as they get closer to the pipe, a peculiarly strong stench of something overpowers the duo. When Derry's able to hear a noise coming from within the pipe, he tells Trish to hold onto his feet while he crawls inside to take a look. Trish accidentally lets go of Derry, and the latter falls down the pipe. Derry is horrified to discover a dying person with his stomach opened and stitched back together. That's not all. He finds endless corpses sewn to the basement walls and ceiling. Upon noticing two bodies sewn together in a corner, Derry realizes they're the bodies of prom couple Kenny and Darla, who had gone missing 23 years ago. This has Derry spooked enough to find his way out of the church, after which he and Trish drive away. They pull up outside a diner and decide to call the cops. While getting out of the car, they find the same truck passing them by and realize that the driver is heading back to the church. Not wanting to waste further time, the siblings contact the police. While they're at the diner, they receive a call from an unknown woman who tells them that they're in danger since they found the house of pain. The woman also tells the siblings that they saw a hungry demon who will stop at nothing once he gets the scent of his target. She further plays out the song Jeepers Creepers for Derry and tells him to run away every time he hears the music without looking back if he doesn't want to meet his ends at the hands of the creeper. A highly confused and disturbed Derry hangs up 
and together with his sister, leaves the diner, escorted by two cops. The officers are driving in their car, driving right behind Trish and Darry, when they get to know from the control room that the church Darry had earlier spoken to them about has caught on fire and that it's impossible to get inside and lay hands on any evidence. Inside Trish's car, Trish is seen surfing through the radio channels when Darry hears a modern version of the song Jeepers Creepers that the strange woman on the phone had warned him about. Unbeknownst to the siblings, the cop's vehicle is simultaneously attacked by the creeper, who takes out the officers brutally, even going to the extent of severing the head of the male cop and throwing it onto the windshield of Trish's car, causing her to stop abruptly. Upon witnessing the decapitated head of the cop lying on the road, the siblings drive off in terror. They eventually stop in front of a house of an elderly woman, asking her to call the police immediately. The creeper catches up with them, breaks into the home of the old woman, and viciously kills her. He doesn't stop at that. He also briefly fools the siblings into believing that the old woman had killed him by placing her in front and hiding behind her body. Trish and Darry finally get a good look at the monstrous creeper. His inhuman face, needle-sharp teeth, cloudy eyes and bushy white hair at the back of his head. While Trish and Darry are able to run to the car, they're unable to start it, and the creeper jumps onto the hood. Trish repeatedly runs over the creeper with the car, and just when she thinks she's killed him, the creeper has a gigantic bat-like wing tearing out of the duster coat and flapping it in the air. Not wanting to take any chances, Trish runs over the creeper again and heads off to the local police station. At the police station, the siblings encounter Giselle Gay Hartman, the woman who had called them at the diner. Giselle elucidates to them the real nature of the creeper and his ritualistic killing for 23 days after waking up from his slumber every 23rd spring. Sergeant Davis Tubbs dismisses Giselle as a psychic and tells her to leave the duo alone and not to interfere in the matter. With Darry asking Giselle what the creeper eats, she tells them about the creeper devouring the desired body parts of his chosen victims. With Giselle further explaining to the duo that the creeper seeks out his prey by smelling fear in them, the creeper is seen pulling up his truck outside the station. Suddenly, the lights at the station go out, and the creeper makes his sinister presence known after feeding on one of the prisoners and healing his damaged self in the process. Sergeant Tubbs tries to shift Trish and Giselle inside a holding room for safety, but not before Giselle warns the duo that she's seen a dream where the song Jeepers Creepers is playing on an old phonograph and that one of the siblings is fated to have a terrible death. The creeper proves himself to be a formidable opponent against the entire lot of the officers and eventually corners the siblings inside an interrogation room where he begins to sniff both of them. After the creeper licks Trish's face, he hurls her aside, making it clear that his chosen one happens to be Darry. By then, the remaining officers have come upstairs, and seeing Darry in the creeper's grips, they point their guns at the creeper. Feeling agitated, the creeper flares out a clawed hood-like structure behind his head and lets out a screeching noise. Trish begs the creeper to take her instead of her brother, and while it does seem for a moment that the creeper is ready to reconsider his decision, he extends his bat-like wings and flies out of the window, carrying Darry with him. The following day, while waiting for a parent to pick her up at the station, Trish finds Giselle and asks her what else she saw in her dreams. Giselle replies that she's just a mad old woman at the end of the day who keeps having these crazy dreams. The movie ends with the audience getting a peek inside what looks like an old desolate factory. Screams can be heard, presumably, of Darry. We finally get to see an old record player playing the Jeepers Creepers song, and Darry's body is seen hanging with his eyes removed. The creeper is seen looking through the empty eye socket, and it becomes clear that he's using Darry's eyes as his own. Salva's Jeepers Creepers effectively keeps us glued to our seats from the beginning till the end. Actor Jonathan Beck as the creeper undoubtedly happens to be the high point of the creature feature, paralyzing us with fear with his mind-blowing performance. Would you believe us if we told you that Salva initially wanted Lance Henriksen to play the creeper, but Breck's audition was so terrifying that he had him cast right away. As for Breck, he was entirely in sync with his character. Reports state that he went to the extent of shaving his head and wearing contacts to a level that he literally went blind. Actors Gina Phillips and Justin Long were deliberately made not to meet Breck when he wasn't in his costume or even see the truck before filming, for that matter. No wonder their appalling reactions were right on point and, most importantly, genuine upon seeing the creeper and his truck, which, needless to say, worked wonders in favour of the movie. However, a leaked original version of the screenplay points out to a rather different ending. The siblings are able to escape from the police station by stealing the creeper's truck. Of course, the creeper pursues them and hops on the truck as well, but gets decapitated by Trish. The headless creeper attempts to pull Darry out of the truck till the latter drives the truck to a railway track, where they're hit by an oncoming train. This not only leads to the truck exploding, but also the death of the siblings. Thank God this wasn't filmed, but uh, had it been, would you have preferred it? Don't forget to share us your thoughts in the comments section.
Every creeper's 23rd spring for 23 days, it gets to eat. Welcome to day 23, Jeepers Creepers 2, 2003. On the 22nd day of the creepers feasting, a young boy named Billy Taggart, while setting in place the scarecrows in the cornfield, gets abducted by the creeper, right in front of his father Jack Taggart and elder brother Jackie. The following day, a school bus packed with high school basketball players, cheerleaders and coaches get stranded on the infamous East Nine Highway. When the driver and the coaches step out of the bus to check what flattened the tire, they find a sharp piece of object that looks like a handmade shuriken with a human tooth in it. Meanwhile, the high schoolers inside the bus hear the local newscasters on the radio discussing about the shocking discovery of close to 300 dead bodies stitched together on the walls and ceilings of an old church. Bus driver Betty, realizing that it's gonna get dark soon, decides to continue with the journey after several attempts of her trying to get help via radio contact proving futile. On the way, cheerleader Minxie Hayes has a strange vision of Derry and a bloodied Billy warning her to go back. In this vision, Minxie also finds the creeper running parallel to the bus and throwing across another shuriken, which simultaneously flattens the same tire previously affected by a similar throwing star. This has the bus completely disabled, and while the coaches are seen setting up flares in the hopes of someone catching their attention and helping them out, Betty realizes someone has purposely flattened the tires upon discovering another shuriken stuck in the tire. The creeper strategically takes out the adults on the bus and comes back later to choose his victims amongst the high school students. He begins sniffing using his third nostril, which happens to be right on the bridge of his nose, and picks out six group members. Mind you, this is precisely and for the first time may we add that we get a close-up view of the demonic monster. He's seen wearing a brown wide-brimmed hat, his skin has thick dark green scales, there are visibly prominent jowls on his face, and dare we disregard his sharp row of needle-like teeth. Soon after, Minxie passes out on the bus and has another vision of Derry, telling her that the creeper wakes up every 23rd spring, and for 23 days he gets to eat humans. Minxie regains her consciousness and tells the other students about her unexplained visions of a dead boy and how the unkillable creeper has been around for thousands of years, further stating that Darry also told her that the creeper will go into hibernation the very next morning for 23 years, only to come back the next 23rd spring. One of the high schoolers named Scott tries to dismiss Minxie, addressing her as a psychic hotline, but the latter is sure that the creeper will come for his chosen victims to consume the body parts that he wants to, having smelled their fears. This naturally has Andy Bucky Buck, one of the students who was also picked out by the creeper as his chosen prey, attempting to communicate on the radio. Bucky's constant pleas for help catch the attention of Jack Taggart, who has his own plans of hunting down the creeper. Jack tells Bucky to hang on and learns of his location, promising to come for him and his friends. While the group is seen momentarily celebrating, thinking that they'll be rescued, the creeper sneakily makes his way on top of the bus, punches a hole in the bus roof, and grabs Bucky by his head. Had it not been for Rhonda to wound the creeper using a javelin, Bucky might have met his fated demise at the creeper's hands. The creeper, angry at having half of his head destroyed by the javelin, flies up into the air, only to crash onto the bus and trap everyone inside, just like it initially planned. The creeper also has one of his wings deliberately landing inside the bus to make prey out of one of his chosen victims, and in this case, Dante. With Dante mocking the creeper's wing and calling it a piece of toilet paper, the creeper captures Dante inside his wing, decapitating him in the process. Next, he's witnessed by Rhonda tearing off his own damaged head, tossing it away and pulling Dante's severed head out of his chest as a substitute head. After this, the creeper flies into the air again, and most of the teens inside the bus decide to exit the vehicle, run through the field, and look for help. The creeper, who simply been waiting for the group to split up and step outside of the bus, begins to pursue them like a winged nightmare, and in the process, kills Jake with a shuriken and pins Scotty with a knife against a tree before flying away with him. A disheveled Minxie, in the meantime, crosses paths with the Taggarts and leads them to the bus, where the creeper is seen trying to capture Bucky for the second time. Jack Taggart uses a powerful flashlight on the creeper, which has the latter letting go of Bucky and spreading his enormous bat-like wings. Both look at each other briefly before Jack shoots the creeper with a homemade harpoon that has its tip strategic made out of the dagger that the creeper had left behind while abducting Billy. The creeper proves himself to be quite strong and resilient despite getting harpooned, and has the harpoon shot at him thrown back at Jack, almost killing Jackie in the process. Jack harpoons the creeper once again, but this only has the latter flipping over the bus along with Taggart's car and escaping from there to look for the other teens. Meanwhile, students Rhonda, Izzy and Double D chance upon a pickup truck that had passed their bus earlier in the morning. Discovering that the truck still has keys, the trio decides to escape from there. Naturally, the creeper, upon finding them, goes after the truck. Double D, who's in the back of the truck, shoots at the creeper with a flare gun, but that doesn't stop the creeper, who continues to chase them. Izzy, left with no other options, pushes Rhonda out of the truck and deliberately slams on the brakes, causing the pickup truck to topple over and injuring Double D and the creeper in the process. Having lost one of his arms, legs and wings, the creeper uses his third nostril to sniff out Double D and is determined to devour the latter to heal himself. Despite being in a horrible state, the creeper leapfrogs after Double D and almost has him pinned down, intimidating him further by 
by flaring out his clawed hood. But this is precisely when Jack shows up and shoots the creeper in the head with a harpoon. Of course, Jack doesn't stop at that. He repeatedly stabs the creeper in the chest to the point that the creeper goes into his hibernation phase. The creeper wails and closes his eyes. While it does look like the millennia-old demonic monster has succumbed to the wounds, he opens his eyes one last time, glares intently at Jack, and marks him as his mortal enemy for the next time they meet. Soon, the clawed hut structure closes over the creeper's head. Fast forward 23 years. The creeper is currently used as a roadside attraction known as Bad Out of Hell by the Taggarts. Three teenagers arrive at the Taggart farm wanting to see the creeper. Jackie, who's a middle-aged man now, charges them entrance fees. The teens find the creeper inside, mounted on the wall, and with it down to nothing but skin and bones. They also find an elderly Jack Taggart inside, watching and waiting with the harpoon at his side. When one of the teens asks Jack if he's waiting for something, Jack nods and says, about three more days. After this, he looks up at the immortal abomination and says, well, give or take a day or two. The movie ends with a zoom-in shot of the creeper. Salva's second movie picks up from where the first film left off. Jonathan Breck not only looks more intimidating, but is also quite comfortable in the role of the creeper. In this movie, one actually gets to witness the creeper hoarding as many victims as he can on the final night of his gruesome ceremonial feast. This means there's plenty of suspense, action, running, and epic moments of ghastly humor. In terms of the storyline, Jeepers Creepers 2 was meant to have characters Trish and Giselle back from the first film, intending to have them hunt down the creeper together in the sequel. But then again, a bus filled with terrorized teens, which was initially just a subplot, seemed far more intriguing to Salva, and he scrapped the characters of Trish and Giselle to emphasize the bus storyline, despite the sequel featuring what is fitting to call an exceedingly straightforward narrative, the film has us glued to the screen throughout the whole runtime of 104 minutes. The Origin of the Creeper Jeepers Creepers comic explored. Mark Andreco and Cuba Bowles' 2018 comic series Jeepers Creepers by Dynamite Entertainment does have an interesting take on the Creeper's origin. There are five issues to explore, and we'll be explaining each of them thoroughly. If um, you happen to be a fan of the movies, <laughs> you're gonna love the comic series. Let's begin, shall we? Issue number one. The first chapter begins with an ominous setting with a bunch of crows flying against the backdrop of a shining moon. A closer peek into the panel and we see the creeper flying, probably with the crows, but we're soon proved wrong when we find the creeper crashing to the ground. As he somehow manages to get up, we find the creeper quite battered and down on his luck. His tattered wings aren't letting him fly for long, and his left hand is missing. The creeper doesn't say anything. Instead, he growls and walks through a barbed wire fence, in front of which stands a rundown barn. Inside, he removes a cover from something that looks like his truck. But before we get to see that or understand the Creeper's motives, the next scene abruptly introduces us to the protagonist of the storyline, Devon Toulson. We learn Devon is a grad student working on his dream thesis on myths in American history, and his research has brought him to Mexico City. With the next panel focusing on the Creeper again, we realize two differing stories are simultaneously taking place in the comic. Anyway, the Creeper's seen driving his truck when he chances upon a man who's pulled over his car on the side of the road. The unknown man ends up signaling the Creeper, asking for help, unaware of the latter's identity. The Creeper is seen getting out of his truck and even from his dark silhouette. One can figure out that wicked smile on his face. The solitary thought of devouring and taking the arm of the helpless person stranded on the road acts like a rush of adrenaline to the Creeper. We go back to Devon, who's seen inside a bus and on his way to visit some of the Aztec temples on his list. He arrives at his destination, the breathtakingly beautiful lost Aztec city of Teotihuacan. The local guide begins feeding information about the Aztec pyramid to the tourists, but Devon clearly has plans of his own. He takes a map from his backpack and looks for the Temple of the Feathered Serpent. Despite signs that strictly state, no entry, trespassing in Spanish, Devon walks right in leaving all inhibitions behind and in order to find more information on his own accord. As Devon ventures inside, he's highly amazed by the images and carvings on the walls. Devon looks at a particular image that catches his interest and wonders how many people were sacrificed to the serpent god. This is precisely when he gets startled by the voice of a young boy who, just like Devon, is also inside the temple. The kid looks at the picture Devon was earlier looking at and asks about the serpent god. Devon responds to the kid, addressing the one in the picture as Quetzalcoatl, the Aztec Serpent God. When the kid asks Devon why the Serpent God is eating the other person, Devon explains to him the whole ritual of how a stable of young men was kept ready for the sacrificial ritual, all in the hopes of keeping the angry, hungry God happy. With the kid showing interest in the story, Devon goes on further, telling him that the High Priest and his acolytes would start their prayers, lay down the Chosen One for the sacrifice on a ceremonial rock, and cut out the still-beating heart from the sacrifice's chest. The cheering of the people and the coppery smell of the hot, fresh blood would then lead the Dragon God to descend from the skies. One look at the Dragon God's silhouette, and you'll realize it's actually the Creeper. Well, this points one in a rather interesting direction. 
How the Creeper has existed since the Aztecs and probably before them, for that matter. Anyway, Devon carries on with the story and tells the kid how the High Priest offers the heart to the Creeper, in this case, the Dragon God, who ends up devouring the sacrificial heart in front of everyone. Of course, the unfiltered description scares the kid, and he runs away from there, screaming at the top of his voice. With Devon running after the kid, he finds a swarm of people outside the temple, one of them being a local police officer pointing a gun at him. Of course, Devon wasn't supposed to be inside the temple, and his actions made him get a tour of the local jail. He's eventually released and left with a warning. As Devon steps out of the prison, he encounters an old lady who hands him a box, telling him that this is what he seeks, and that he should take the box and leave. Devon opens the box to find a strange-looking dagger, and by its looks, it clearly looks like it belongs to the creeper. By then, the old lady had already left, and as Devon tried to pick up the dagger, he accidentally cuts himself. This catches the creeper's attention in some weird way, thereby establishing that the creeper has a telepathic connection with Devon. Now, while we don't exactly know where the creeper is, it seems like he's inside one of his lairs, which looked pretty similar to the House of Pain from the first movie. One can see bodies sewn and hung up on the walls. Anyway, the creeper looks around and says, Find me, if you dare, thereby marking the end of the first issue. Issue number two. The second chapter has Devon heading to North Carolina in pursuit of the Creeper. However, he doesn't tell that to his friend, Nina. He's seen driving all the way to the Cherokee Indian Reservation, looking for clues regarding the Dragon Guard. Devon's quite sure that the serpent god he came across in the Lost Aztec City was just one of the many examples of the dreaded ancient beast with wings and a penchant for feeding on humans. Devon's also convinced that the entity has been there for a very long time now, in different forms and cultures, and that there are too many similarities in the descriptions to be some hive mind. As he drives down the road, Devon states to himself that he knows he's onto something, but also questions if he really wants to find that out. Devon stops at a bar for a drink, and when he looks at the tattoo of a bartender, he begins to ask him multiple questions about it. Upon asking if the tattoo is that of the Octana, Devon is met with hostility and eventually makes his way out of the bar. Outside, he encounters an aged Native American who warns him that the path he's following is exceedingly dangerous. Devon realizes the man can help him, and the latter tells him to meet him the following day. The next comic panel shows us the creeper in his lair. He's seen taking a lantern and descending a secret passageway. The creeper's clawed hood structure flares out, after which he's seen going to sleep. Both the creeper and Devon's sleeping poses bear uncanny similarities for reasons not explained right away. Devon, who had slept in the car the previous night, gets woken up by a cop who keeps pestering him with questions until the old Native American turns up. After the cop leaves Devon, the man takes him to a remote cabin in the woods. He asks Devon if he's sure enough to go down the path and offers him a drink, stating it as mulberry wine. Devon begins to hallucinate soon after, and the man cuts his palm using a dagger. Through captivating hallucinogenic visions, the man tells Devon the tale of Octana, how the Octana has lived amongst the humans since man first walked the Earth's surface, and that the Octana was the most feared and respected of all the dark creatures. The man further tells Devon that his people knew feeding the Octana voluntarily would protect them from his inhuman wrath, but then again, feeding the Octana wasn't that easy. The Octana was in constant need of human sacrifices, the same way the Feathered Serpent or the Dragon God demanded. In simple words, the Octana was none other than the Creeper. While in the vision, it almost felt like the Creeper was directly communicating with Devon, and the latter wakes up screaming and finds himself inside his car at some parking lot. Confused, Devon gets out of his car, wondering what's happening to him, when he sees a swarm of crows cawing and landing on top of his car. This can't be a good sign, right? But then again, this is exactly where the second issue ends. Issue number 3 Chapter 3 has a highly bewildered Devon lying on his bed with his eyes wide open. He gets a call from his mother, but doesn't pick up. Instead, he decides to take a long shower. Upon finding the cut on his palm healed up, Devon wonders if his hallucinations are a sign of him having schizophrenia. With him looking at his reflection in the bathroom mirror, the creeper simultaneously shows up in the same glass, and judging by the latter's looks, he surely looks angry. Both realize that they're somehow connected to each other, whether they like it or not. Anyway, the creeper's seen picking up a human skull and smashing it against a wall. The next panel has Devon coming to a realization that he's psychically linked to the immortal cannibal demon and then making his way to Roanoke for further research. While driving, Devon nearly hits a truck that almost looks like the creepers. Though he manages to get a grip on his car, Devon ends up being bruised. Among the same time, we also find the Creeper hurt because of the duo's mutual psychic connection. The Creeper decides not to sleep till he severs his ties with Devon. As for Devon, he makes it to a bed and breakfast in Roanoke and hits the Historical Society, a place packed with cosplayers and a setting that looks more like a renaissance fair of some sort. 
Upon finding an empty room, Devin takes out the dagger given to him by the mysterious old lady he'd encountered outside the prison and cuts his palm to see if he still has the healing power. Initially, nothing really happens, but as he steps out of the room, he finds that somehow he's gone back in time and the people outside aren't cosplaying anymore. They look pretty authentic. Suddenly, Devon finds a man mumbling about someone taking something from him. As Devon approaches the man, he sees the latter's eyes gouged out. While this clearly looks like the work of the Creeper, the man alerts everyone about someone coming. Of course, this has everyone breaking into chaos. Some decide to run and some believe it's the work of the devil. Devon and the readers get to see the Creeper, who in this particular era is seen to be an incarnation of the devil. The winged nightmare descends upon the people, brutally attacking and killing them. The Creeper is able to spot Devon amidst this chaos. He goes to him, takes the dagger, and carves something on Devon's hand. It's fitting to state that Devon passes out. When he wakes up, he finds himself on the ground surrounded by the cosplayers. It dawns upon Devon that he was thrown back to a period when the Creeper as the Devil terrorized the colony of Roanoke, but of course that's for Devon to understand. So he blames his low blood sugar for collapsing, and as he steps away from the crowd, Devon feels a stinging sensation in his hand. As he looks, he finds the word Centralia carved on his forearm. Issue number 4 Chapter 4 begins with a flashback. Here, Devon is a 10-year-old boy who's seen playing with his toys. We learn how Devon as a kid was fascinated by monsters, both the real ones like the T-Rex and those featured in movies such as werewolves, vampires and lizard men, wishing they were all real. Well, one should um, be careful what they wish for as the next comic panel has the elder Devon inside some cave engaged in an intense fight with none other than the Creeper. Devon screams at the terrifying looking Creeper and asks him why he'd not leave him alone before piercing what looks like a spear into the very chest of the Creeper. The Creeper lets out a scream in pain and smacks Devon across a wall which breaks and has him falling down a mineshaft. While the Creeper is seen pulling out the spear from his chest, Devon finds his coat caught up in a wooden plank. Nevertheless, he leaves the coat hanging, jumps down and tries to find his way back up. As Devon turns on the flashlight of his phone and ventures into the darkness, the readers are taken to another flashback. We find ourselves in the year 1962. A group of miners is seen walking down the same mineshaft. Two of the miners have big hopes of discovering unexplored riches. The duo enters an enormous crypt only to find the corpse of a fellow miner, Dylan Chapman, missing both his eyes and an arm. That's not all. The entire place is filled with countless dead bodies. The nightmarish spectacle scares the shit out of the miners, and they decide to get out of there immediately. Well, no points for guessing that they certainly didn't make their way out of there, courtesy the Creeper. Somehow, the mineshaft catches fire, leading to a massive explosion which results in a series of other blasts all throughout the mining town, or in other words, Centralia. The next panel has us back to Devon, who finally manages to stumble his way out of the mineshaft. Luckily, he finds his car parked outside and the keys inside his pant pocket. But just when you think luck is favoring Devon, the creeper finds him, pulls apart the car sunroof, and flies away with him. Issue number 5 Chapter 5 picks up right where the previous issue had ended. Devon finds himself hanging upside down inside what looks like the Creeper's lair. There's a puddle of blood below Devon, and what follows next looks like some pre-feeding ritual. The Creeper dips his hand in the blood and smears Devon with it, beginning from his navel up to his face. The strong stench of the blood makes Devon puke, especially after some of the blood goes inside his mouth. The Creeper gets Devon to stand straight, after which he locks lips with him, much to the latter's chagrin, and then hurls him aside. As Devon attempts to untie his hands and legs without letting the Creeper know of it, the latter continues his bizarre ritual. Is the Creeper licking Devon's bloody mouth bizarre enough for you? Well, we think so. Anyway, as the Creeper continues to do so, Devon manages to break free from his restraints and, using a sharp pointy bone that he found lying, resorted to breaking himself free. He stabs the Creeper's eye with it. This has the Creeper highly annoyed, so much so that his clawed hood flares out, and after managing to take out the bone from his eye, he throws it back at Devon. The Creeper is also seen angrily charging at Devon, but the latter lays his hands on a couple of skulls lying across and repeatedly starts hurling them at the Creeper. With one of the skulls hitting a massive boulder above the Creeper, the rock starts breaking into numerous pieces. Devon takes a sizable rock and keeps hitting the Creeper with it, going to the extent of crushing the Creeper's head. The next panel has Devon waking up in a hospital and finding Nina and his mother beside him. The duo tell him to relax, and just when we think the nightmare is finally over, we realize the whole scenario is just an imagination. Of course. Devon would be a fool to believe that killing the Creeper would be this easy. In reality, it's Devon who is dead. As we approach the final comic panel, Devon's lifeless body is seen lying on a table with the Creeper standing next to him, having taken his eyes. Reign of Terror, Jeepers Creepers 3, 2017 The film opens with a prologue that shows the Creeper pursuing a highly terrified man 
He was running and screaming for his life. Upon finding an approaching truck, the man starts heading in that direction only to have the creeper fly away into the sky with him. The other man steps out of his truck to figure out what happened, and a severed hand falls from the sky. Cut to 23 years later, we're back to the night of the first movie's events. While the creeper had flown away with Darry, he left behind his truck, parked right outside the Poho County Police Station. Now, with the police managing to open the nightmare on four wheels, they realize even the truck is a horror on its own. Not only do they find the truck filled with dead bodies and flies buzzing all around, but a police scanner inside the slaughterhouse on wheels makes them realize that the creeper has been listening to them the entire time. Soon, they realize that the truck is also highly booby-trapped when spikes emerge from the truck bed and end up severely injuring an officer in the process. With the arrival of Sheriff Dan Tashtego, Sergeant Davis Tubb fills in the events that took place earlier in the police station and how the creeper flew off with Darry. This is precisely when a harpoon-like thing shoots out from the truck's tailpipe, showcasing how dangerous the truck actually is. While Tubb shows the sheriff the window from where the creeper flew away with its victim, another officer informs them a tow truck has taken the creeper's truck to impound. With the sheriff showing extreme urgency to get the truck back, Tubbs learns from the sheriff that the creeper has been around for a very long time and that the truck happens to be the creeper's rolling history. Tubbs stresses to the sheriff that they'll destroy the truck in the impound, and the latter tells him that the truck won't even make it to the impound in the first place. True to the sheriff's words, the creeper lands on his truck and cuts the cables that connect his truck with the tow truck using his battle axe. Driver Frank and Deputy Dana Lang in the tow truck witness the creeper's truck driving off on its own. Then, to their absolute horror, they find the creeper standing on top of his truck and the vehicle seemingly passes them. Of course, the truck returns, stops at a distance, and then out of nowhere, the creeper lands on Frank. Lang attempts to shoot the creeper, but the latter signals him not to do so with his fingers. After this, the creeper flies away with Frank, and his truck appears to follow him. While all of this is happening, the sheriff is seen telling Tubbs how the creeper never hunts in the same place for more than a day, and that he's done with Poho County. The only logical thing to do would be to head north and follow the ravens and crows, as the birds tend to travel when the creeper does for some unknown reason. The sheriff further states that he looked the creeper in the eye 23 years ago, and that both seem to know each other. The following day, an elderly woman named Galen Brandon sees a vision of a dead son, Kenny, who was killed by the creeper 23 years ago. Kenny tells Galen that the creeper has pieces of him left behind that are full of secrets about him, but the creeper will come looking for what's buried, and that when he does, he'll kill anyone who's there on the property. Kenny specifically warns Galen to leave from there to save herself and her granddaughter, Addison. This naturally leads to Galen asking her granddaughter to go away for a few days, telling her that she's expecting unexpected company. He's seen assembling a new force consisting of the creeper victim's families to hunt down and end the creeper. One of his men, Michael Miller, shows the sheriff a powerful old Vulcan cannon capable of shooting 20mm and 6,000 rounds per minute. The sheriff asks Tubbs to be a part of his team and help him kill the creeper for good. Soon afterward, while dirt biking, a group of teenagers come across the creeper's truck parked in a field. Naturally, the truck catches their attention, and the group becomes curious to find out what's inside it. As they go near the truck, they find the license plate that reads, Be Eating You, and judging by their conversation, they seem to be well aware of the creeper and his stories of driving around and eating people in a truck with the same license plate. Anyway, after one of the boys pees on the truck's cow catcher and another boy named Kirk bangs on the truck's back door, it opens up. Inside, they find smelly bodies wrapped up in bloody sheets. With Kirk taking a closer peek, the spikes emerge from the truck bed. Luckily, no one gets hurt, and the group attempts to run away with their dirt bikes. However, Kirk gets shot in the leg with the harpoon shooting out from the truck's tailpipe. While his friends attempt to free him by trying to pull out the spear, the creeper comes back and kills two of the boys using another spear. It isn't exactly shown what the creeper does to Kirk right away. He comes back to his truck, closes the back door, and is about to drive away the truck when the distinct smell of one of the boys urinating on the truck's cow catcher earlier catches his attention. Of course, the creeper is seen as highly enraged and goes after the last boy in the group, who was the first to flee from the scene on his dirt bike. It's also around the same time Addison is seen going to buy hay for her favorite horse, Rocket. With her unable to pay for the hay, her friend Buddy, who has a massive crush on Addison, buys her some hay and even offers her to come along with him to deliver more hay to a plantation house, which Addison happily agrees to tag along. As for Galen, she's seen digging up something from the front yard despite Kenny appearing and warning her not to do so. The sheriff, on his way to Galen's house, tells Tubbs that he met Galen for the first time 23 years ago, the night her son Kenny disappeared on his way to the prom with his date, Darla. Please tell us this rings a bell? We'll even give you a hint. It's got something to do with the first movie. The body of a couple discovered by Darry inside the House of Pain? Uh, does this remind you of something? <laughs> it better. 
Anyway, we come back to the present story, and as per the sheriff, Kenny and Darla's bodies were never discovered. With Galen finally accepting the horrible death of her son at the hands of the Creeper, she was determined to be a part of the sheriff's force. This has the sheriff further stating to Tubbs that that was what marked the beginning of this hunt for the Creeper in the first place. We find Galen putting an earth-covered, rugged sack that she dug out from the ground on a table. As she opens the sack, she sees the severed hand of the Creeper, and with her touching it, Galen goes into a state of trance. Addison and Buddy arrive at the plantation to find the owner terrified and a couple of workers hiding underneath the cars. The owner tells Buddy to call the sheriff immediately for help and bring an armed force along. When Buddy's unable to start up his truck, the creeper arrives and overturns a trailer parked behind. Somehow, Addison catches the creeper's interest and he approaches Buddy's truck, after which he lets out a wild roar that shatters the truck's glasses and then flies away with Addison, leaving Buddy wholly traumatized. Soon, the sheriff and Tubbs arrive at Galen's house. Galen tells the duo that when one touches the hand, one gets to see how the creeper came to be and what the creeper actually is. This has the sheriff peaked enough to touch the hand. He believes the secret to what the creeper is, is the secret of how to kill the creeper. In short, it's fitting to say that the sheriff is determined to find a way so that the creeper stops existing. As for Addison, she's seen waking up inside the creeper's truck. Kirk's also revealed to be alive, and with the duo attempting to escape from the truck, a metal rod impales Kirk in the head, killing him on the spot. Back at Galen's, the sheriff's new force is seen arriving, after which the sheriff touches the hand and goes into a hypnotic trance. With the sheriff and his team learning from the police scanner about a flipped vehicle, they realize the creeper is nearby and decide to chase him. The sheriff and Tubbs eventually find the creeper driving down the East Nine Highway in his truck. Tubbs aims for the truck's tires, but the bullets bounce off when he shoots at them. Tubbs tries shooting at the back door, only to realize the whole truck is bulletproof. The creeper is also seen deploying a rolling mine from his truck, which Tubbs is able to overpower. To the sheriff and Tubbs' utmost horror, they find Michael approaching the creeper's truck from the other end of the highway. Michael is hell-bent on using his Vulcan cannon on the creeper, unaware that the rounds will only fire back. Well, that's precisely what happens when he shoots at the creeper's truck, and with the bullets deflecting, Michael gets brutally killed in the process. Another rolling mine flips the sheriff's car, making it crash land in a field. The creeper stops his truck and approaches the duo with his battle axe. Tub shoots at the creeper, but the latter manages to evade the shot using his battle axe. The creeper takes it personally when one of Tubbs' shots blows away his hat, and the former ends up using a shuriken on Tubbs, destroying his shotgun in the process. Tubbs takes out a minigun, but before he can shoot at the creeper, the sheriff calls out the creeper, diverting his attention to him instead of Tubbs. The sheriff resorts to Michael's Vulcan cannon, and while he's able to riddle the creeper with bullets, none of the shots have any serious effect on the creeper. In short, the creeper manages to split open the sheriff's head using his battle axe on him and leaves from there, summoning his axe back while walking away. Later that night, Buddy approaches Galen and tells her that the creeper had taken away Addison. As for the creeper, he returns to his truck and finds Addison still alive. Addison's smart enough to use the same technique that led to the death of Kirk by having the creeper's head impaled. This buys her just enough time to jump out of the truck without having the doorway spikes close on her. Addison runs through the field and the creeper attempts to go after her. However, the creeper discovers that he's unable to fly, thanks to his wings getting damaged during his fight with the sheriff, so he ends up hurling a shuriken at her. But Addison survives the throw after she trips down a ruck. Frustrated, the creeper throws a spear at Addison, but it only ends up impaling a jacket. The creeper is next seen approaching Addison with his battle axe, which only leads him to get hit by a passing truck. Addison takes advantage of the opportunity and runs away from there, but we can't vouch the same for the driver, though. With the driver stepping out to see what he hit, the creeper pounces on him and kills him. After this, the creeper is seen returning to Galen's farm to take what he'd left behind, only to find a cardboard with a message that says, We know what you are, in bold, and his severed hand pinned to it. The creeper takes out the nail, grabs the severed hand, and crumbles it to dust, after which he growls in anger and his clawed hood flares out. While the creeper lets out his howl of rage, many crows are seen falling dead from the sky. As for Addison, she's seen finally reuniting with her grandmother and Buddy. A voiceover in the background states how the creeper reshapes the mind and changes the course of one's life. The following day, Buddy pays a visit to Addison before leaving for a high school basketball game. No points for guessing in the very bus that gets ambushed by the creeper, as seen in the second film installment. The voiceover continues and the viewers are flash forwarded to 23 years. Here, we find an older Trish Jenner vowing to get a revenge on the Creeper for the death of her brother, Darry, and asking people to join her in her fight against the Creeper upon his next arrival. 
Jeepers Creepers 3 hit the theatres after a gap of 14 years, and it's fair to say that one of the primary reasons the third movie was such a disaster was solitarily because of Victor Salva's past criminal record. Not only did this wreck the franchise, but despite the announcement of a fourth movie, the studio decided not to involve Salva in any way. In fact, those who have seen the third movie and paid proper attention to the details will realise there weren't any graphical scenes of the Creeper devouring human organs. Well, that was explicitly because Salva was strictly not allowed to have such scenes on display. Moreover, details of Salva's criminal act became available online, leading to fans of the franchise reconsidering their views of Salva's movies. In fact, several protests were made against the third movie and also its release, for that matter. Anyway, coming back to the movie and its high point, it's definitely the nifty manner in which the storylines of the first and second films have been linked with the third one that genuinely deserves commendation. As for the Creeper, in this movie, he loses his charm. You get to see so much of the Creeper that he's no longer that enigmatic entity. Also, we never really understood why he changed his fashion game. As much as the Duster Coat looked good on the Creeper, he looked ridiculous donning a red t-shirt. God knows why he did that. Death gives it life. Jeepers Creepers Reborn 2022. Elderly couple Ronald and Marie are seen playfully driving through a countryside listening to music on the radio. Suddenly, the radio starts to dysfunction and plays the song Jeepers Creepers by itself, giving fans a clear hint of what will follow next. Ronald eventually observes an old rust-colored truck approaching behind them with a license plate that has Be Eating You written on it. Odd, does this sound a bit all too familiar to you? Well, it does to us. Ronald is initially entertained by the truck and its vanity plate, but when the truck gets a tad too close to them and begins to honk at them repetitively, the couple gets frightened. Ronald signals the driver to go around as the truck keeps tailgating them, and it's only a brief time that the truck passes them by, driving away rather aggressively. The experience has the couple highly shaken up, and they've hardly let out a sigh of relief when they find the same truck parked next to what appears to be an abandoned church. Upon seeing the driver throwing down what looks like bodies wrapped in some sheet down a chute sticking out of the ground, Marie gets highly unsettled by such a disturbing sight. She tells Ronald to drive away from the area as fast as he can. Ronald does so only to find the same truck pursuing them, and this time at full speed, may we add. After an intense car chase scene, the couple's car runs off the road, and Ronald decides to report the entire matter to the police. Eventually, Ronald convinces Marie to return to the church and look into the chute before telling the cops about it. They go back and find a bloodstained piece of cloth hanging on the side of the chute, and as they take a closer look inside, something horrifies them. Well, isn't this the kind of story that should go on without the slightest bit of an intervention? Sadly, a massive unforeseen interruption takes place, breaking the entire story flow, and we realize the whole thing was some documentary featured in the fictional Macabre Mysteries. The following sequence introduces us to the young couple Chase and Lane, who are driving to attend the Horror Hound Festival in Louisiana. It was Chase who was watching the elderly couple's story on his phone since he's a large horror fanboy. So much so that he literally dragged his scientist girlfriend into coming along with him to the carnival. On the way, Chase is seen constantly filling Lane about the Creeper, stating how he's real and stressing on the Creeper's gruesome ceremonial feast for 23 days every 23rd spring. Lane believes in facts, therefore she doesn't accept anything about the Creeper as true. Suddenly, she stops the car, gets out, and runs at a distance to puke. There's a shuriken stuck on the tree trunk that she overlooks, and out of nowhere, a white raven with blood-red eyes appears and starts observing Lane. Meanwhile, Chase, who's in the car, is seen leaving a voice note to his mother, where he expresses his love for Lane and tells his mother about his big plans of proposing to his girlfriend later that night. As viewers, we also get a good look at the ring that Chase got for Lane. The next scene has the creeper waking up from his slumber and crawling out of what looks like a rundown farmhouse. He's seen consuming a handful of soil and worms and grubs to regain his strength. While eating, the creeper's clawed hood flares out, after which he approaches a scarecrow and takes hold of the attire. As for Lane, well, she gets on a call with a friend named Sam, who is also attending the Horror Hound Carnival but is travelling on his own. Lane discloses to Sam about her pregnancy and that she hasn't had the chance to let Chase know about it. Sam and Lane agree to meet each other directly at the festival and hang up the phone. The Creeper, in the meantime, makes Sam his first victim, beginning his traditional killing spree with him. Lane and Chase are next seen stopping by a voodoo shop to ask for directions. Lane encounters the shop owner, Lady Manila, and asks her for the festival's address. With Lady Manila handing her a map, Lane accidentally touches her and experiences a strange vision. She chooses not to tell Chase. And while they're leaving the store, Lady Manila congratulates Lane on the baby, but then realizes Lane hasn't told Chase anything about the baby yet. 
After they leave, Lady Manila ends up on the phone with someone, stating that they have a tree bearing fruit, after which she rubs the belly of a voodoo doll. The couple checks into a hotel, where both are seen trying out several cosplay costumes. While taking a pregnancy test, Lane has a disturbing vision. She screams in horror when a black raven slams into the bathroom window. Chase lightens the mood, saying it's just a bird, after which they're seen gearing up for the horror carnival. As for the creeper, he's seen finally taking off the cover that hid his truck and taking a good look at his weapons. It becomes clear from the creeper's expression that he's majorly missed his medieval battle axe, and we also get a look at a hook that he's seen intently staring at. Lane and Chase finally arrive at the Horror Hound Festival, and the latter can barely control his excitement. The carnival has ardent horror fans dressed up in their favorite costumes. From fire jugglers and demonic disc jockeys to terrifying-looking clowns and sword swallowers, the horror fair has every possible attraction associated with horror. A highly excited Chase ends up addressing Horror Hound as the Coachella of cosplay to Lane. Suddenly, a man who seems to have been hit by an arrow in his chest comes running and screaming and falls dead on a table. Eventually, he drops off his horror act and ventures deeper into the woods for a smoke. Of course, he gets attacked by the creeper there, who brutally kills him and heads toward the direction of the fair. Lane and Chase come across the latter's favorite carnival game, Sharp Attack. The goal of the game is to throw shurikens at the target. Lane picks up a shuriken and admits that she's never seen anything like that before, but she turns out to be highly skilled at the game. A local named Stu tells the couple to check out the creeper drawer which he addresses as the highlight of the whole festival. Lane briefly experiences another disturbing vision after accidentally cutting herself with the shuriken. In the vision, she has this red circle with a dot in the middle on her forehead and finds herself naked and surrounded by a bunch of cult people, all cladded in hoods. At this point, her vision breaks and Chase takes her away. Soon, we find the festival organizers preparing for the creeper draw and host Carrie is told to take things ahead. Carrie informs a highly elated crowd that the grand prize of the Creeper Draw happens to be one night at a Creeper-themed escape room for two at the old Barnabet house. Lady Manila, who was earlier seen tampering with the chits of the participants, is called upon the stage to announce the winner, which obviously turns out to be Lane. The couple is called backstage, and they meet Jamie, the show's producer, who tells the duo that he and his team will be going with the couple to film the entire event as part of the deal with the Horror Hound Festival. Stu tells the group that he'll be their local tour guide for the night and takes them to the Barnabet family cemetery, informing them that they all have to walk from there to the house. When Jamie asks cameraman Michael to take a proper shot of the cemetery, Michael informs him that the camera stopped working and he has no clue why. In the meantime, Lane gets particularly mad at Chase and the latter's act of being over-friendly with Carrie. As a result, she storms out from there and has Chase going after her. This is also where we get another proper look at the creeper, who seems to be standing on what looks like a hilltop. He's seen donning his signature duster coat, ragged trousers, and a hat. His pointy, razor-sharp teeth are also visible, and he begins to sniff victims. As part of the creeper's new powers, he also has an infrared vision that lets him choose his future victims, and no points for guessing that he spots Lane soon enough. With Chase going after Lane, Michael is also seen to follow a hooded figure inside the cemetery. Believing the person's from the Horror Hound Festival, he asks for a phone. Michael gets a quick glance at the figure, who's revealed to be Madame Carnage, the one to have announced the creeper draw along with Carrie. As Madame Carnage disappears inside a mysterious door in the cemetery, Michael is startled to find a white raven behind him. He relaxes himself, only to have the creeper attack him from behind and kill him. Coming back to Chase and Lane, the former realizes that Lane is simply jealous of Carrie, which is why she's angry at him. He realizes this is the perfect time for him to propose to her, and just when he's about to do it, the creeper grabs Lane and flies away with her. A panic-stricken Chase returns to Stu, Jamie and Carrie and only manages to utter that something big has taken away Lane. He tells the trio to call the cops right away and attempts to run from there, only to tip over Michael's bloodied corpse lying on the ground. Jamie inspects the wound and realizes whatever attacked Michael is still out there. This has the group freaks out and run towards the mansion to take shelter inside. As for Lane, she wakes up bound to a red sacrificial stone and finds the creeper right in front of her. With the creeper piercing a sacrificial dagger in her stomach, Lane lets out a loud scream, which surprisingly isn't heard by Chase or any of the members of the group. This clearly means that the creeper has brought Lane to a separate place, one where no one will hear her screams. As for the remaining group, they enter the mansion to find themselves locked inside. This is when we get Lady Manila, Madame Carnage and a man in a white blazer earlier seen at the carnival standing outside the mansion. It becomes pretty evident that they're all part of a cult that not only believes and worships the creeper, but also wants him reborn for some reason. Inside the house, the group begins to fight over their current situation. With everyone blaming Stu and even cornering him, 
he takes out his pistol and fires a shot above. This naturally catches the attention of the creeper who's seen pulling out the dagger from Lane's stomach and flying towards the house, with the group as his new targets. This is also when we get to see a horde of ravaging white ravens circling right above the Barnabet mansion. The creeper crashes through the attic window and faces the group for the first time. He makes this distinct whistling noise that's almost unbearable to the humans. Somehow, Stu, Jamie and Carrie are able to open the attic door that the creeper previously locked with his battle axe, and the group is temporarily able to escape from the creeper. As for Lane, she's able to free herself using the very dagger that the creeper had used to pierce her stomach. She grabs some lying shurikens and escapes from the room through a vent. By the time she reaches the Barnabet mansion, the creeper is already done with Michael and has just killed Carrie. After the creeper drags Carrie's body to devour her brain, the group secures themselves inside a room, one that's more like a voodoo altar. This is where Lane has another vision, which is more like a continuation of her last vision, and is seen coming face to face with the creeper. After the vision, Lane looks around and finds a voodoo doll that resembles Darry Jenner from the first movie. Of course, the group isn't able to connect anything. It's only after they lift this heavy stone that they discover how the creeper has been feeding all this while. Lane confesses to Chase that she's pregnant and the reason the creeper is after her is because he wants her baby. She further tells them that the creeper is old, stinks of death and needs her baby to be reborn to draw power from the life source. The group realizes that they can't let the creeper have his way and that they must devise a plan quickly. Lane looks at the dagger she used to escape and tells the group she knows precisely what needs to be done. The plan is to bring the creeper outside the mansion to a particular spot to execute the job. Lane draws the creeper outside kneels on the ground and places the dagger in front of her. Next, she's seen surrendering to the creeper, who picks up the dagger and lifts Lane up. Stu and Chase, in the meantime, make it to the topmost level of the mansion. As the creeper attempts to stab Lane with the dagger, Lane screams and lets the creeper know that he can't have her baby. After this, she attacks the creeper's ears with the shurikens, leading to his clawed hood flaring out. Lane targets the creeper's eyes next, blinding him with the same shurikens. This has the creeper moving recklessly, attempting to grab Lane, and with him reaching the target point, Chase and Stu push the weather vane from above, and it ends up impaling the creeper. A horde of ravens attacks Chase and Stu. Stu loses his balance while defending himself and falls to death. While Chase helps Lane get back into the mansion, the ravens disappear with the body of the creeper. Soon, the police arrive, and as Lane takes a final look at the mansion, her eyes turn completely black. Now, this can only mean one thing. Remember how the creeper had initially plunged a dagger into Lane's stomach? Well, of course. That was a part of the ritual, and by doing so, he'd left his essence inside her. The movie ends with the creeper being reborn and letting out a demonic roar somewhere not too far away. Some interesting facts and mysterious theories revolving around the creeper. Of course, there's more fear and imagination when it comes to not knowing what the creeper actually is, but with the creeper's origin remaining a big mystery to date, it's fun to point out many of these strong theories that revolve around who the creeper is and where he's actually from. Is the creeper an alien parasite? Some believe that the creeper was an aged Wild West wicked cowboy who discovered a parasite that had fallen from the sky. The alien symbiote attached itself to the back of the cowboy's head and used his body to drain energy. This had the cowboy thinking that he was dying and well, who knows, maybe he was actually dying. Somehow, right before his death, he found a dead bird and consumed it, after which the cowboy's feet transformed into bird-like talons. Soon, the cowboy realized that in order to survive, he had to feed, which in turn would make him stronger and keep the alien parasite from killing him. At first, he began to feed on animals, birds for talon-like feet, bats for his wings, and even a crocodile for his reptile-like scaly skin. While it's true that he was devouring animals, somehow it wasn't just enough for him, and that's when he began to eat humans. Also, one of the primary reasons behind his hibernation is that the creeper uses very little energy while sleeping, which means the parasite will take much longer to kill him. So, there's a possibility that the creeper doesn't really want to kill people, but then again, he knows that this is the only thing that's keeping him alive in the first place. This is why he's always seen feeding on the weak by smelling their scent of fear in them. This is just a theory, and most believe that the creeper has been around since the beginning of time. Is the creeper a fallen angel? What if we told you that the creeper is a fallen angel turned into a demon who's simply buying time until his judgment day? Sounds about right. Well, there are plenty who believe that when God exiled Satan and his followers from paradise, one of the fallen angels didn't land where he was meant to. Instead, he landed on Earth and continued to wage his war against God by slaughtering God's favorite creations. Well, like it or not, this does make sense. Remember the first movie where the creeper dumps his victims down a pipe that ultimately leads one to the basement of an old abandoned church? Now, if you remember the victims that Darry Jenner found sewn to the basement ceilings, they all looked like they were being crucified. Well, come to think of it, what better way than to mock God for that matter? Is the creeper a vampire? Okay, 
Not exactly a vampire, but some theories state that the creeper is a human bat. Well, when it comes to human bats, they have the appearance of a man and the features of a bat. So, while they do have the face, arms and torso of a man, and also walk like humans do, they have these huge bat-like wings that just can't be disregarded. Now, the primary thing with vampires is that they need fresh blood to live forever. The creeper is also seen to have a somewhat similar ritual, but instead of the blood, the creeper needs fresh body parts to survive. Also, if one looks at the creeper, one can tell that he really does have similarities to a bat, from his wings to his sharp, needle-like teeth. He resembles a bat in every way. Also here, we'd um, like to point out a particular thing that came to our attention. Remember the the ending of the second movie that had the Taggart family using the Creeper as a roadside attraction, naming it Bat Out of Hell. Well, they could have come up with Monster Out of Hell, and even Demon Out of Hell, but instead chose Bat Out of Hell. Would you call this a mere coincidence? We sure wouldn't. Is the Creeper a Wendigo variant? Well, here's another interesting theory that suggests that there's a possibility that the Creeper's origin is rooted in Native American folklore. Or, in simple words, the Creeper is a Wendigo variant. Now, everyone's well versed with Wendigos as mythological creatures who are always hungry, and may we add, for eternity. But then again, the Wendigos don't have wings, and are usually associated with winter, north, and all things cold. <laughs> so, despite the Creeper being seen on a relentless hunt for 23 straight days, it doesn't exactly fit the shoe here. But there's no denying that this is an interesting take. Let's talk about him, his powers, and interesting anatomical facts. So, who exactly is the Creeper? Well, meet this ancient beast who's been around for a very, very long time now. He loves driving around in his personalized truck, which, uh, mind you, is a horror on its own. Also addressed as the Slaughterhouse on Wheels, the truck is mainly used to transport the bodies of the Creeper's victims, and it's entirely bulletproof, even the tires, for that matter. The doorway is extensively booby-trapped with spikes. Explosives such as rolling mines can be deployed from underneath the truck, then there's this custom harpoon that shoots out from its tailpipe, and the interior is rigged with all types of knives, metal rods, and spears. The truck seems to operate as per the commands of its master, which of course brings us to the Creeper. Now, when you look at the Creeper from a distance, he looks quite human. What else are you supposed to make out of someone who's seen donning a duster coat with ragged trousers and a wide-brimmed hat? In fact, it's the Creeper's sartorial sense that'll give you one the impression of a fairly built guy. But all that'll change the minute you get to see his face. He has dark green scaly skin needle-sharp teeth, a third nostril up on his nose, a pair of bird-like talons, <laughs> and let's not disregard that thick patch of white hair at the back of his head. The creeper also has massive bat-like wings underneath his coat and a clawed hood-like structure behind his head, which he flashes when he wants to frighten his prey or feels restless. In terms of his strength, the creeper is way too strong, flipping all kinds of vehicles, ripping open car frames and hoods, and tearing human body parts using just his hands. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much the creeper. The creeper's also seen possessing a horde of weapons at his disposal, such as handmade shurikens made out of his victims seems flesh and bones, a medieval battle axe, custom-made spears along with several kinds of knives and daggers with cryptic drawings and carvings on them. Personality-wise, he's very twisted, and one can't figure out what goes on inside that mind of his. The Creeper loves to play around with his victims before killing them, but that isn't the case when he's on the 23rd day of his killing spree. On the 23rd day, the Creeper is completely ruthless and will go after his chosen ones even when critically wounded. Otherwise, he's pretty strategic while choosing his prey, and as seen in the second movie, he intentionally takes out the adults on the bus before singling out his high school victims after vigilantly studying each one of them. The Creeper can also comprehend human emotions like pain, amusement, anger, fear, and even sympathy to an extent. In fact, as seen in the first movie, with Trish begging the Creeper to take her instead of her brother, it almost felt like the Creeper was actually reconsidering his decision to choose Derry. Eventually, he did what he wanted to do, as he is someone who loves to play by his own rules. The Creeper comes across as one who simply shows no remorse or empathy for his victims. As seen in the House of Pain, the Creeper has even gone to the whole extent of creating grisly art pieces, sewing bodies on the walls and ceilings, thereby showcasing his twisted mind. Can the Creeper regenerate? Well, this is precisely what the high point of the Creeper is. His ability to regenerate any part of his body, and all he needs to do is consume a similar body part of his victim. In case you're wondering, this is how he survived since ancient times. Naturally, this particular ability of the Creeper also works as a healing factor because this gives him the power to tear apart his damaged body parts and devour the substitute organ from his victim. Now, in addition to his regenerative powers, the Creeper also possesses an extremely high level of durability. We'd like to stress on the Creeper enduring endless gunshot injuries in crucial areas as well as high-caliber machine gun wounds as seen in the third movie. That's not all. He's even sustained harpoon injuries, has been badly hit by oncoming vehicles and at very high speeds may we add, and dare we disregard that he's fallen from altitudes that can prove fatal to humans. But none of these have been able to stop the Creeper. He's only seen to stop when he reaches the end of the 23rd day of his gruesome ceremonial killing spree. 
The creeper can smell specific organs of his victims. Well, the creeper possesses a third nostril that's basically on the bridge of his nose. This lets him smell fear in his victims and the particular body parts he wants to feast on. We'll give you two examples. The first is from the second movie, which has the creeper taking a good look at the students inside the bus to single out his victims after strategically taking out the adults first. This is where we get a proper view of his third nostril for the first time in the franchise. Another example is from the third movie, which has one of the teenage dirt bikers peeing on the truck's cow catcher. When the creeper comes back to his truck, the particular smell of the piss makes him realize what had taken place, and this obviously has the creeper going after the boy to make him his victim. Can the creeper survive without his head? Well, in the second movie, we did see the creeper tearing apart his damaged head and replacing it with the severed head of one of his victims. What we don't know, or rather what hasn't been shown, is how long he can survive without an alternate head. The second film makes one realize that the clawed hood, along with the wings, is the real part of the creeper, which in all probability can't be replaced. Also, if you've paid attention to every detail of the movie that has the creeper on display, you'll realize that the hood remains intact with the original torso, and it's just a new head that gets reinstated there how to kill the creeper, can we? Well, if there really was a way, the creeper wouldn't be back every 23rd spring now, would he? The creeper's been run over repetitively by a car, hit by trucks and shot with a harpoon, as well as a mighty old Vulcan cannon that's capable of shooting 20mm and 6,000 rounds per minute. But none of these have been able to stop this ancient demon here. It's fair to say that he can be hurt, but there's no way he can be killed. Of course, this is our belief, but that's not what dedicated fans of the franchise have to say. Upon realizing that the ability to regenerate himself gives the creeper his power of immortality, some believe that the primary way to kill him would be to starve him of his victims to stop the creeper from regenerating in the first place. Are you wondering how this can be done? Well, apparently, there can be three different ways to do it. The first way is to put the creeper inside an unbreakable iron-walled prison right at the onset of his 23-day killing spree, and then keep him isolated in an area with no living beings. The second way is to cast the creeper in concrete and then drop him into the deepest part of the ocean. The third way is the funniest, but if it can be done, there is nothing better. Some think the creeper should be located while he's hibernating, put on a rocket and sent to the sun. Well, we know it's crazy, but what would you prefer if you were given a chance? Do let us know in the comments below. Jeepers Creepers 5 everything we know so far. First things first, everyone knows that the original three movies in the Jeepers Creepers film franchise deftly connected the three narratives, making it one big story at the end of the day. But with Team of War and Sola's Jeepers Creepers Reborn that released in 2022, the film was tactically made as part of an entirely new trilogy, serving as a reboot for the series, with not the slightest bit of any association to Salva or his original trilogy. Warren Sola and screenwriter Sean Michael Argo not only roped in a new actor to play the Creeper, but also had a completely new script to offer. As the first chapter in a new intended trilogy, Reborn failed to connect with fans both old and new, but there's no denying that the flick did end on a note that paved the way for future stories. But before we tell you how Reborn sets the events of its sequel, let's take a few steps back and try remembering how the movie ended in the first place. Chase and Lane are successful in impaling the Creeper, but with the arrival of the Creeper's minions, who, in this case, are hordes of ravaging ravens, the birds disappear with the body of the Creeper. Of course, the Creeper is seen getting resurrected, and he gives a rather nasty look before the screen goes black. This naturally indicates that he'll undoubtedly be coming to exact his revenge on the couple as they attempt to leave rural Louisiana in the sequel. The sequel can also shed light on the mystery behind the birds, the connection with the creeper, and most importantly, who the creeper really is. But that's not all. Lane is also seen to develop some form of a psychic connection with the creeper, and her eyes go completely black at the end of the flick. Of course, there wasn't any explanation as to why this happened, but it points fans in a direction that states how she became a weapon down the line. Who knows, she might even team up with people who desperately want to put an end to this nightmarish predator. Another important arc that we'd like to stress is that the fifth movie can also make use of Lane's disturbing visions to show how and when the Creeper was born, and why the Creeper needs to hunt and eat human body parts. Also, if we're exploring story arcs for Jeepers Creepers 5, another storyline that ties Reborn with its sequel would be how the cult discovered the Creeper and decided to worship him. This will help one understand why the Creeper chose Lady Manila and Madame Carnage, amongst others, as his underlings, when he could have easily eaten them as part of his need to survive. Having said that, there are many who don't want the story of Reborn to get continued in Jeepers Creepers 5, having been thoroughly disappointed by what the previous movie had to offer. If you ask us, we made peace with our minds after watching Reborn and are going through a denial phase where we firmly believe that the movie doesn't exist. To every fan who thought the third movie was a big disappointment, <laughs> you're wrong. It's categorically not the worst entry in the franchise. If not anything else, Warren Solo's Reborn only made us have further cravings to have characters Trish, Giselle, Minxie and the Taggarts back in the 
fifth movie and give a proper conclusion to the original trilogy. With that being said, nothing is certain about Jeepers Creepers 5 except that one of the fan pages in Brazil reached out to Sean Michael Argo, and the screenwriter confirmed that there will be a fifth movie. This can mean many new things and points in different directions, but right now we've got to be patient about it. We promise to reveal more information as soon as we know anything. Marvelous Verdict. Well, that's all for today. And with this, we finally come to the end of our video here. So, doesn't just the mere thought of the Creeper send chills down the spine? What is it about the Jeepers Creepers franchise that you love the most? Also, what other story arcs are you looking forward to getting explored in the fifth movie? We'd love to know your thoughts in the comment section down below, and we sincerely hope you've got your fill of horror for today. Now, if you enjoy this video, you know what to do. Please do leave a thumbs up and stay tuned with us as we promise to come back with more exciting content. Till then, goodbye! And thanks for watching. Have a nice one.